Well, good morning and thanks for uh, joining us. This is Tony Elwick, founder and CEO of Stratagen. And uh, let us get started with uh, today's uh, webinar. Again, thanks for being here. You know, one of the most uh, interesting parts of innovation uh, to me has always been uh, market segmentation, uh, which is what we'll be talking about today. And it all ties back to uh, strategy, of course. Uh, you know, companies are all depending on strategy in order to grow. Uh, whether you're trying to uh, come up with a business model innovation strategy or a strategy for disruption or digital transformation, uh, in every situation, um, there's a dependency. And the dependency is on understanding customer needs and coming up with uh, or discovering segments of customers that have different unmet needs. And we've found this to be true in nearly every market over the years, is that uh, you know, it's very rare that a market is homogeneous. You know, marketing 101 comes into play here. Um, in nearly every market, there exists segments of customers with different unmet needs. And it's critical to understand who those uh, customers are and what those needs are in order to uh, succeed at our digital innovation strategies or market segmentation strategies or uh, business uh, strategies. So, so that is the goal. And there is one key problem associated with all of this, and that is um, there is no language to communicate uh, what a need is. And in fact, in most companies, there is an agreement on what a customer need even is, never mind uh, what all the needs are, or which ones are unmet. And this forms the basis of, uh, of, a, of the problem, basically. Um, you know, there are segments of customers with different unmet needs. We need to discover them, yet we uh, don't agree on what a customer need is. And what we've learned over the years is that um, you know, in order to be successful here, you have to create the right language for defining the need and the need structure. Uh, companies certainly aren't short in, uh, on uh, customer insights. They have uh, thousands of different uh, inputs that come in from multiple sources throughout the day, weeks, months, um, and they get all these different types of uh, pieces of information. Um, but there is no agreement, like I said, on what the structure of those statements should be. And this is what takes us to outcome-driven innovation. Uh, we learned this 25 years ago, and uh, we've been on a, uh, a path to figure out you know, what is the perfect need and how can we use those insights to guide uh, all kinds of strategies. So this is uh, taking play over the last 25 years. ODI, ODI uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, has a great track record that we'll talk about a bit. And it's all founded on a simple premise. And that is that uh, people buy products and services to get a job done. And when we start thinking about this, uh, it changes the way you approach uh, every aspect of innovation. Because what we want to discover are segments of people who struggle to get the job done differently. Uh, this is going to cause us to define markets differently and customers differently and needs differently and segments differently. And if we look at the market through a uh, jobs be done lens, we can begin to uh, alleviate all these different issues that arise in most organizations. I think most companies would agree that needs-based segmentation is the way to go, but they struggle on all fronts, starting with what a need is. So what I thought I would do um, for, for this uh, webinar is to go through an example uh, of a company that we worked with uh, back in the early 2000s. And this will demonstrate uh, the power of the segmentation approach. Um, Bosch, who uh, wanted to enter the North American circular saw market, had a very stiff competition. Uh, they were um, competing against Walt, Makita, uh, many others, and they had to come up with a, a circular saw that would get the job done better at a price point that was c competitive with Walt and Makita. Uh, they had to win over shelf space in Lowe's and Home Depot in order to make this happen. So the challenge was quite large. And um, what we decided to do is to um, apply ODI in this space and see if there are segments of customers that have different unmet needs. So this is the path we went down. And what I wanted to do is to uh, tell the story of how, uh, how this worked. Um, and it turns out that they, after um, executing ODI in this space and doing outcome-based segmentation, uh, we were very successful in helping Bosch uh, create the CS20 circular saw, which is still one of the top um, performing circular saws from a revenue generation standpoint to this day, which is a good 12 plus years later. So let's talk about that story. Uh, the story begins by defining who the customer is. 
and um, and as in many markets, you know, you have multiple customers. Uh, with uh, with Bosch, they had retailers who were buying these circular saws from them and carrying them into distribution channel. Uh, with general contractors, they have people who are um, buying uh, great numbers of circular saws for their uh, tradesmen teams. And then, of course, you have the professional tradesman who's using the product to get a job done. Now, like in many markets, the first question is, who do we focus on in order to innovate? And the lessons we learned over the years uh, take us down the path of focusing on what we call the job executor. This is the person who's using the product to actually perform the job. It's not the buyer. It's not the distributor. It's not as if the buyer or the distributor uh, are insignificant. They certainly play a role. But when it comes to product innovation, uh, focusing on the person who's using the product to get a job done is the starting point. So this is the starting point for Bosch. The professional tradesmen, they're the job executor. Uh, we found that roofers, framers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, uh, they're all using circular saws to get a job done. So the second question we ask is then, what is the job that all these different people are trying to get done with a circular saw? And uh, through qualitative research and talking with the customers, we discover over a number of interviews that the goal in their mind is to cut wood in a straight line. Very simple. Now, I'm using this example, and I know it is simple. And um, coming up with the, you know, the job definition through the eyes of the customer is not always that easy. Uh, so, you know, as you try to apply this internally, you know, keep that in mind. Getting the job defined at a level that's too narrow will limit your ability to innovate in your space because most products are just getting part of a job done. And if you define just part of the job and the customer is trying to get a bigger job done, you're limiting your ability to create value for them. By the same token, if you go too broad or incorporate emotional jobs or things that you can't innovate around from a uh, product standpoint, functional standpoint, then it's going to become more difficult to, uh, to head down the right path as well. So those are a couple of interesting points. Uh, the next part uh, of the process then is to begin to analyze the job. And uh, to do this, we, we conducted qualitative interviews with roofers, framers, electricians, plumbers, and so on to figure out the steps they go through uh, in order to make the cut. Now, um, the job map, as we define here, is not a process map. It's not a customer journey map. It is a map that describes the job that the customer is trying to get done. And notice we say trying to get done, because in many cases, they may not be getting the entire job done. They just may be getting part of the job done. So they're trying to do certain things, and they're using workarounds or maybe just eliminating it altogether because they can't find a way to do it. But in effect, they're trying to get the entire job done. Now, one thing I find interesting about the circular saw market, this sounds like it's a very simple commodity type product, yet there are a good number of steps that people must go through to make a cut. And they first have to define the cut path. What are they trying to do? How deep does the cut have to go? How straight? Um, uh, they have to determine how to make the cut. Uh, which tools should they use? Gather the needed tools, prepare them, prepare the wood. Uh, prepare the uh, cut path and make sure everything's all set before they can actually make the cut. And then once the cut making starts, they have to monitor that, make adjustments as they go, and uh, conclude, see if the um, if the wood looks the way they want and if the cut turned out the way they liked. So there's more to it than just cutting a piece of wood. Uh, there's a lot of uh, detail behind it. In fact, the detail really becomes obvious once we start going down uh, to discover what are the needs associated with getting the job done? We have a hierarchy here that we follow. Uh, we focus on the job, cutting a piece of wood in a straight line. We look at all the job steps. And then for every step, we discover how customers measure value. So these are the outcome statements, hence outcome-driven innovation. This is what really drives the approach, is understanding at a very detailed level how customers measure value in getting the job done. So over the years, we've defined um, an outcome. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about th the thought process behind that. Uh, when you start thinking about customer needs, um, they are part of a communication process that takes place between the customer and the company. And the goal of that conversation is to produce a statement that will help the company create value for the customer. 
So the statement has to define how customers measure value and how a company can create it. So we're trying to define a language that allows the company and the customers to communicate to form these need statements. Now, when we start thinking about what makes the perfect need statement, uh, they would have to have uh, some unique, very unique characteristics. The first thing is that it would have to be the way the customer measures value. So it's a customer measure of value. Uh, it's going to be the way the customer thinks about success, value, uh, as they're getting the job done. Uh, it also has to relate to getting the job done better. Uh, what we've learned is that in order to get a job done better, you can get the job done faster, you can get it done more predictably, or you can get it done with higher output and throughput. And these statements would have to relate to either getting it done faster, more predictably, or with higher output throughput. Uh, statements that don't relate to this obviously wouldn't be good measures of, of value and descriptive of how to get the job done better. Uh, the statements also have to be free from solutions, specifications. They can't define the solution. Um, you know, at a very high level, innovation is all about coming up with solutions that address unmet needs. And if we go to customers and we're looking for their needs, but they're offering us solutions, then we still don't really understand what their needs are. So these statements must be free from solutions and specifications. Uh, one of the biggest factors is they have to be actionable. Uh, one of the complaints um, a lot of our clients make is that they do a tremendous amount of research, but they can't do anything with it. It's inactionable. And that's often because these statements that they're collecting from customers aren't measurable and controllable in the design of the product or service. In other words, it's got to be something that you can take action on as you're creating and designing the product that would deliver the desired result. So making it actionable, making it measurable and controllable is key to success. Uh, another important characteristic, if it's achievable, would be to make these statements stable over time. Uh, and we've all learned, or been taught to believe at least, that customer needs change quickly over time. Um, and if they do, then it's very hard to focus on a need today and put a product out in the market and then a year from now you get it out there and customers have changed their minds. Uh, that's awfully frustrating and you know, a common complaint of our clients. Well, if we need to find a need that uh, is valid today, that's valid next week, next month, next year, five years from now, that would be hugely valuable in terms of, of guiding the client, uh, client guiding, uh, guiding customers into the right direction. And the last piece is that these statements, they have to be used across the organization. Uh, sales, marketing, development, R&D, uh, individuals in all those different parts of the organization are trying to create value for customers. It would be very difficult if each organization defined its own language of customer needs and then couldn't communicate even between function internally. Again, we hear this is a common problem uh, amongst um, companies as well. So ideally, a, a customer need would follow all these uh, very unique characteristics. And this is what we've worked towards over the last 24 years is to figure out uh, a statement that could be defined in such a manner that all these uh, qualities would, would come into play. And we call these statements desired outcome statements. Uh, in effect, what we've, what we've done here is we've created a language around which to communicate what a need is. And the statement is useful across uh, all functions. It can be used by sales, marketing, development, R&D. It's, it's actionable and controllable in the design of a product. You can actually take two competing solutions and see you know, which one's best at minimizing the time it takes to align the blade with the cut line when initiating the cut, for example. Uh, this statement um, uh, would be valid over time as well. So as we start thinking about this, coming up with the perfect need statement uh, certainly has not been simple, but it's something we've worked on over the years uh, and we've applied it in nearly every industry that, um, that, ex that exists. So once we have, um, uh, once we understand what a need is, we can start down the path of collecting these needs. We do this through qualitative research, of course, and uh, these need statements. Um, you know, one of the first things we realize is that uh, there's not five or ten needs. There's often between 50 and 150 different metrics that people use to measure success when getting a job done. So you can see some of these as we go through the process here. You know, minimize the time it takes to set the saw to the desired cut angle or minimize the likelihood that the dirty table inflicts damage on the material 
or so on, or minimize likes of coming into contact with the moving blade. And for uh, whoops, and for each of these steps, uh, there are um, anywhere between five and fifteen different metrics that people use to measure success and value when getting the job done. So what we've done so far is we've looked at this commodity type market. We decided not to go ask about the circular saw, but instead let's go look at the job of cutting wood in a straight line, figuring out what that job looks like and how do we measure success. We captured these 75 different metrics that uh, will come into play as we move through the rest of the process. Now, what I wanted to do here is just take a couple of minutes to um, allow uh, for a few uh, questions. And Chris, maybe you have a few questions from the uh, audience. Yeah, we have some good ones. Do you ever segment around anything other than desired outcomes? Uh, the answer is generally no. Uh, we The whole goal here is to figure out, uh, you know, are there segments of customers with different unmet needs? So um, we focus on on the desired outcomes. The questions might be, um, you know, are we looking at outcomes on one job, two job, um, consumption chain outcomes? Uh, sometimes we throw some of those factors in there as part of segmentation, but 99% of the time, we're just focused on the outcomes related to the core job. How precisely stated do the outcomes need to be in order for their segmentation to work? Uh, that's a good question. So, um, of course, precision uh, in our view is everything. Uh, these are the key inputs into the innovation process. Uh, if there's deviation from the standard, uh, then we're breaking the rules and you find that various things can happen. Um, if, if there's solutions in statements, for example, we set, tend to see that they factor and cluster differently, and it can certainly impact the way uh, the rest of the process is, won, uh, is run. So, um, you know, we're very focused on uh, making sure there's a very robust set of, of uh, outcome statements that follow the rules that we've defined. What role do personas play in the ODI segmentation process? Uh, personas, uh, you know, we've um, heard a lot about personas, and I'm, uh, and I'm sure that um, uh, many organizations still use them. Um, personas in general are a qualitative way to attempt to segment the market. At least that's the way I think about it. It's taken some potential stereotypes of customers and assuming that uh, there's masses of customers that fall into that same category, and more importantly, that those different personas have different unmet needs. Um, what we've learned is that it's very rare that you can uh, randomly figure out segments of customers with different unmet needs unless you actually actually segment the market statistically around unmet needs. So while you know conceptually the idea of uh, personas is interesting, um, using them uh, or using any qualitative type of method to segment markets uh, we find to be um, inaccurate. Uh, you know, if you can formulate a uh, market or product strategy, best to do it around a statistically valid segment of customers, and which is why we follow the approach that we do. And next, we'll talk about the quantitative portion of this, which gets at that. All right, Chris, thanks for the questions. And so we'll continue on, and uh, there'll be time to back in as well for a few more questions. So let us continue. The segmentation begins by collecting the statistical data. So uh, in the case of Bosch, we had 75 different outcomes, and we asked 270 users, again, uh, framers, general contractors, roofers, carpenters, remodelers, and so on, uh, to tell us how important each of those outcomes were when they were last using their circular saw, and how satisfied they were using the product that they were using. So we knew if, we knew if they were using DeWalt, Makita, or whatever brand. So we get this data back from them, and we can begin analyzing it. Uh, we do this by plotting it in what we call the opportunity landscape. And here you can see uh, this one dot here, which is a desired outcome statement. You see the importance running to the right, satisfaction vertically. And this one dot gets plotted here because 81% of those rating that need rate it a four or five for importance, yet only 30% rate it a four or five for satisfaction. Now what we're looking for here are outcomes that are important and poorly satisfied. And if they meet both of those criteria, we say that they have a high opportunity score, and anything with an opportunity score over 10 gets plotted in this purple area over here on the far right. So what this allows us to do is to figure out where the market's underserved, along what dimensions, and where it's overserved. 
And of course, the question we love asking here is, you know, uh, what are the chances of Bosch randomly coming up with a solution that addresses the 14 or so unmet needs if it doesn't know what those needs are? And the answer, answer of course, is uh, slim to none. Now, this was sample data that I showed you here. What I want to show you is the actual data from the um, Bosch study. When we look at their 270 uh, tradesmen that took the survey, uh, the market looks like this. So upon first glance, you look at that and say, well, um, for the most part, you know, they're uh, very satisfied. They're either overserved along a number of dimensions or uh, very satisfied that there's nothing that's underserved. Now, we see this in many markets, and this is why we never uh, recommend building a strategy around the market average, because the market average is exactly that. It's an average. It's an average of different segments of customers that have different unmet needs. And this is what we've learned over the years, is that um, in, in nearly all markets, there are segments of customers that have different unmet needs. And the way to discover them is to segment the market but not segment the market around trade, for example, or uh, where we look at dem uh, the demographic view of general contractors, electricians. Uh, we see that trade isn't really explaining differences in customer needs. Uh, the experience of the user really isn't um, explaining differences in customer needs. And we see this over and over again. We've seen this in so many studies, uh, gender, age, uh, region of the country, size of the business, size of the family. They don't explain differences in unmet customer needs. And the premise here is very simple. If we are trying to discover segments of customers with different unmet needs, then the only way to find those segments is to segment around unmet needs. Again, uh, if we can't agree on what a need is and we haven't collected those needs and we haven't prioritized those needs, uh, needs-based segmentation becomes uh, impossible. But by focusing on it in this fashion becomes uh, a practicality, and it leads to some pretty amazing results. Now, I did want to describe briefly the approach that we use. We talked about step one and two, where we uh, capture the, the needs, uh, the outcomes around the job to be done. We quantify them for importance and satisfaction. The techniques that we use uh, are, include uh, factor analysis and cluster analysis, typical segmentation tool sets. And then we work to profile the segments so we understand who's in those segments. So the way this works is we get our data set and we can ask for a two-segment solution or a three or four or five-segment solution. Now, we generally ask for a three-segment solution, sometimes four, um, to see, you know, are there under and over-served segments and what are those segments in between? And then in the end, we want to figure out, well, who's in those segments and why did they exist? Now, keep in mind, when we segment the market, we don't know why these segments are being created. We just know that they statistically cling together and they're valid. And what we need to do after the fact is figure out, well, who's in them? Well, this requires a little bit of, um, of planning because um, if we don't ask the right questions in our survey, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to figure out who these people are and why their needs are different. So uh, what we do is we take a lot of time up front uh, crafting together the correct, as we call them, uh, profile questions so we can discover uh, uh, who's in these segments and what is making them unique and what's driving people to struggle more than others to get the job done. Now, applying all this, we end up with a segmentation scheme that looks like this. So this is the actual Bosch segmentation work. And you can see four different segments of customers here. And uh, it follows a, a pretty interesting visual pattern. Uh, over on the top left, you see a segment of customers that really are highly overserved. And over in the far right, you see a segment of customers who are underserved along 14 different dimensions. So they have 14 of those 75 unmet needs exist. Now, here's the interesting thing. You know, the, what are the chances of Bosch randomly coming up with a solution that addresses those needs? Uh, if it doesn't know that that segment exists, and if it doesn't know that those are the 14 unmet needs in the segment. And of course, the answer is slim to none. And this is the power of the approach. Uh, if you're trying to discover opportunities or hidden segments of opportunity in a commodity type market or any market for that matter, uh, segmenting around the unmet needs is extraordinarily revealing. The segment on the far left over here, in the red segment, 
highly overserved. Uh, this segment is comprised of people who um, basically cut two by fours. That's it. So when you're cutting two by fours, uh, you, um, you have a blade set to one height, blade set to one angle. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter to any great degree um, where you start the cut, where you end the cut. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. Uh, the edges don't have to be perfectly smooth uh, because two by fours are typically used for framing and things like that. So when you look at that segment, you say, well, that segment's highly overserved. You know, uh, offering them a new circular saw is not going to really get any traction. But what we found over in the far right are a segment of customers that uh, struggled more to get the job done because they made more complex cuts. They had to make longer cuts, long big pieces of plywood, for example. Uh, they had to make more angle cuts and more finished cuts. And because they had to make these other more complicated cuts, they had 14 unmet needs that none of the other um, segments had. So this became Bosch's focus, was to concentrate on this segment of customers and to create a circular saw that would address these 14 needs. Now when we start looking at this, you know, here's the, here's the 11 of the 14 needs. Uh, you can see that uh, they're very specific in terms of what Bosch would have to do in order to satisfy each of these needs. Uh, so specific, in fact, that when the Bosch team was presented with the results of this uh, of the survey, and we talked to them about the segmentation and presented in this slide, uh, we, we then uh, proceeded to engage them in an ideation session uh, where they conceptualized the CS20 circular saw. It took them three hours to conceptualize the CS20 circular saw. And as they said, you know, we've had many of these ideas before, but the problem is we've had thousands of ideas before. And of the thousands of ideas we have in our ideas database, uh, we really didn't know which ones created the most value. And randomly selecting these 14 just would have never happened. But uh, knowing exactly what segment to go after, knowing what 14 unmet needs exist, now allowed them to focus very specifically on creating value for this segment of customers along these dimensions. So this is what they did. They went to work doing exactly that. Uh, they looked at these three outcomes, for example. Uh, minimize the likelihood of snagging the cord on the material. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, circular saws, and um, they, they typically would have an extension cord tied to the cord, and you, when you tie it together, you typically wrap it up in a little knot. And that knot would often get caught on, on pieces of wood as you're making long cuts. So the cord would get snagged on the material as you're trying to make the cut. Uh, they would also cut the cord, uh, and when they would cut the cord, they would render the saw useless because they'd have to go in for repair. That was a common complaint. Also, they wanted to minimize like the dropping the saw and lowering it from a ladder or from the rafters uh, because they would typically use the cord as the mechanism for uh, lowering the, the saw down to the ground. Now, what the Bosch team was um, challenged with was to come up with ways to satisfy these 14 unmet needs without adding any cost to the product. While that seemed like a, a huge challenge up front, uh, when they started thinking about this, they came up with this direct connect feature, which allowed them to take the cord off the circular saw and allow someone to take an extension cord, wrap it in a specific uh, format here, as you can see in the picture on the left, and plug it into the circular saw. Now, what this allowed them to do is to satisfy all three of these needs. Uh, because there was no clump of cord together, now there was no snagging. So they eliminated that completely, satisfying that need to the greatest degree. Uh, minimizing the cost of repairs due to cut cords. Uh, well, if you cut the extension cord, you just go grab another extension cord and plug it in. And so they, there was minimal downtime with the circular saw uh, if that were to happen. And then lastly, you know, lowering it from a, uh, a ladder or the roof, uh, rooftop or rafters, uh, they, the way they came up with this direct connect system, uh, it made it impossible for the plug to come out and for the saw to fall to the ground. So by satisfying these three outcomes, uh, they were adding significant value. And in addition, they reduced costs because they eliminated the cord. So uh, that saved them about $3.50 per unit uh, to go and innovate in some other areas, which is what they did. So by focusing on the other sets of needs, they were able to come up with other uh, inventive ideas. Uh, this one, for example, uh, minimizing the likelihood that debris is thrown up into the user's face when making the cut, 
and minimize the likelihood of inadvertently moving off the cut path when, make, uh, when making the cut when the lines covered with dust were two um, important and unmet outcomes. And for those of you who've used circular saws, you know that um, oftentimes as you're, dry, as you're pushing the saw down the cut path, the sawdust is building up on the front of the uh, uh, path line and it covers the line. You reach over and you know, blow the dust off of it and try to clear it. Uh, and that would cause problems as well. So what they did is they redirected the airflow uh, from the circular saw to push the, uh, the, the dust off the cut line and bring it up and around the blade and shoot it down behind the user, down towards the ground, away from the user's face. So by satisfying these two needs as well, they were generating more value for the customer. And we could go on. Uh, there's a number of other uh, innovations that were uh, put into play here as well. One is a positive bevel stop feature for those who had to make more uh, angle cuts uh, before you'd have to uh, unscrew the back, make the adjustment, screw it back in place. What they did here is they put positive uh, detents in place, and enabling it to um, uh, you know, quickly find the, the correct angle and lock it into position. And lastly, uh, they added a raptor hook. There were another couple of outcomes. Minimize the time it takes to secure the saw when it's not in use, uh, often up in a raptor, up on a ladder, and minimize the likelihood of dropping it. So uh, by adding a hook, they're addressing two additional needs. So that's the example. Now, I know that this example seems uh, pretty simple and that many of you are in more complex industries than uh, creating circular saws. Um, but I wanted to offer some other examples as well then. While this is very successful and led to a, uh, a hit product, uh, it, it's, um, it's just one of many that we've created over the years. And there's so many different things that you can find out when you're segmenting the market. So I wanted to offer a few other examples as well. Uh, in the technology space, we've worked with lots of um, you know, high-tech companies, and one example I wanted to talk about was with uh, General Motors, uh, where we're focused on helping people uh, reach a destination on time. And here, you can see uh, by this three-segment solution that there's a group of customers over on the far left who, yes, they have to reach a destination on time, but they really uh, don't struggle that much because they go to the same location each day, they leave at the same time, uh, they know the traffic patterns, backup routes, so they really don't struggle that much. But a segment over on the right, we discovered that they are traveling to many locations throughout the day. Uh, they leave at different times. They don't know traffic patterns, the backup routes. They're not sure where to park. They're not sure how long it's going to take to walk from where they park. And because they encounter all these additional complexities, they struggle more to get the job done. And this is a very common theme that we see. In many markets, there is a segment of people that struggle more because they're, they encounter more complexities than anyone else in getting the job done. And by focusing on these highly underserved segments, you can employ you know, what we call profit share strategies because these segments that are highly underserved are often willing to pay more to get the job done better as well. And these are strategies that you know, Nest has used, that Apple has used, Whole Foods, American Express, and so on to carve out very winning strategies and positions uh, in their respective markets. In looking at the medical space, um, which we've completed maybe 40% of our business over the years, uh, we recently came across this um, segmentation scheme here, which I thought was highly interesting. And you can see two segments that are uh, underserved, one highly underserved over in the bottom right, but you see the segment on the upper left-hand corner that's very overserved. Now, as it turns out, that very overserved segment is made up of the most advanced customers in this space. Uh, the market was uh, around diagnostics, and uh, there are a group of physicians that uh, excel in this. In fact, they just use the equipment to verify that their that their instincts were correct, and their instincts are correct. They're they're lead users, in fact, and the company treated them as such. In fact, uh, most of the inputs that the company would get to create better products came from the set of lead users who you can see are highly overserved. Now, I thought this was rather ironic because, of course, you know, this company is trying to become customer-centric, yet they're focused on the segment of customers that's not representative of their real market. And we see this um, come into play. Uh, it's come into play in multiple cases where lead users really don't represent the rest of the marketplace 
and that can pose, of course, a, a problem when you're trying to formulate a strategy for growth uh, in your marketplace. We have other examples as well, some from the financial industry, um, for example, uh, in insurance, where you see different segments of customers that have uh, very different uh, views of what needs are unmet. And you can see some people over here in the, in the red segment that are quite satisfied with maybe just a handful of unmet needs and other segments over in the far right that are highly underserved along nearly every dimension. Understanding who these people are and what part of the job they're struggling with and offering up a, a new insurance offering that gets the entire job done instead of just pieces of the job done can prove uh, pretty helpful if you want to drive innovation uh, in the insurance space. Uh, also in industrial components, uh, in the industrial companies, uh, we've seen segmentation schemes that look like this, where you might find three segments of customers and they're all, none of them are highly underserved, but they all have some set of unmet needs, all different from each other. And this is often very interesting as well. So uh, in a case like this, you could take a product and add feature sets uh, that address all the remaining unmet needs but target them differently at the three segments of customers that exist. Interestingly, in this case here, uh, one of the segments was more focused on getting the job done faster, so many of their unmet needs related to speed and getting certain parts of the job done. Uh, one segment was focused on uh, predictability, uh, where they had uh, variations in, in feedstock, which was causing them to have variation in their output. And the third was um, focused on uh, improving areas of efficiency to get greater output and throughput. So we never know what we're going to find when we segment the market, and that's the reason why we do it. Uh, trying to come up with a uh, market strategy or product strategy that's one size fit all uh, really doesn't work because there is no average market. You know, in every market there are segments of customers with different unmet needs, and the goal is to find them and focus on them and to create value uh, around those new insights. The, um, team, uh, the CPG world as well uh, has uh, many examples, and I showed you the one already, uh, which was from Bosch, so we won't go further into that. But there's really three key uh, factors that come into play here that drive success in this space. If we're trying to discover hidden segments of opportunity, we first have to agree on what a customer need is, and that means you know, agree on the common language across sales and marketing and development and R&D as to how we're going to define a customer need and have that you know, agreed upon and valid across the organization. The second step, of course, is then gathering and prioritizing those need statements for the market that you're focused on. This is key to success. Not doing the statistical work is going to lead to uh, random results. The chances of you randomly coming up with a statistically valid segmentation scheme by using personas or any qualitative method is uh, highly risky at, at the very least and misleading uh, at the worst. So going on that path uh, is not something we, we recommend. And once you have this data, then of course the third piece is to use it correctly to segment the market and make the segmentation uh, decisions and make the subsequent product and market strategy decisions that will lead you to success and growth. So that summarizes uh, the, uh, the view on segmentation. Uh, Chris, uh, I was going to call you back in here to see if there's any other questions that we have from the audience. Yeah, let's see here. Um, are you concerned with the length of your questionnaires and how do you handle fatigue? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question. So we often ha have that question. So um, you probably noticed that you know, 75 outcome statements means a fairly lengthy questionnaire. Uh, in addition to that, there's profiling questions, there's screener questions. So there might be 100, 125, 150 different questions that um, that we include in the survey. Now, while, um, while many researchers say that you shouldn't do that or can't do that, uh, we've been doing that for a good 25 years. Um, the thing is that we've developed the methods for making it highly efficient to ask that many questions. So, um, you know, asking those questions, it really isn't a big issue. Uh, you know, we've 
formulated the questionnaire format in, in such a way it makes it efficient. It's a, typically a 25-minute interview. might be lengthy. Uh, there is some fallout. So um, what we've learned in nearly each of our markets is that uh, anywhere between 5 and 20% of those people taking the survey uh, really aren't you know, paying as close attention as you would like. You know, they might be taking a 25-minute survey in 10 minutes. So we know they're really not paying attention. So uh, we've put a lot of good quality checks in place to make sure that those who aren't uh, playing by the rules, so to speak, don't get included in our sample design, uh, a sample um, output. So as a result, uh, you know, we feel very confident that we're getting very high quality data um, to make the decisions. And the alternative really isn't that great. You know, focus, uh, looking at um, some subset of needs and making decisions qualitatively up front before quantifying all of them uh, really doesn't make much sense either. We never know where the opportunities are going to lie. So uh, you know, why, why reduce the risk of finding an opportunity for success uh, prematurely by you know, excluding it from the questionnaire? Earlier you, meant, earlier you mentioned um, three and four segment solutions. Mm -hmm. Do you ever choose more than three and four uh, segments? Uh, so sometimes we do. Uh, generally, we, we like looking at three and four because from those we can figure out are there under and over surf segments. Uh, but then other factors come to play. Uh, in some markets, um, like in the food industry, for example, you might be very happy to find a smaller segment, maybe 10% of the market, that has some unique unmet need. Uh, so we've done some work in some of um, you know, some food industries and others where we might look at seven, eight, nine, ten segment solutions to see if something really uh, pops out that's unique. Uh, generally, most companies uh, with their product lines uh, don't want to formulate you know, eight or nine or ten market strategies. You know, they're looking for one or two or three tops. So uh, keeping the number of segments down to uh, a smaller number makes uh, pretty good tactical sense. And then here, last question. How do you capture the complex, uh, complexity factors? Okay. Yeah, I did mention those complexity factors. So, uh, you know, that's key. We, we need to know what's driving complexity in the market and put those questions in the survey. So what we typically do in the qualitative phase is to um, uncover qualitatively uh, what variables enter the equation that make the job more complex. So in the case of Bosch, for example, uh, short cuts versus longer cuts, um, accurate cuts versus cuts that don't have to be that accurate, uh, or you know, deep cuts versus shallow cuts, or angle cuts, for, you know, and those kind of things. So we look at things that can cause variability in terms of making the job harder, and uh, we include those in the survey and use them for prof profiling questions. Any other questions, Chris? That's all we've got now. All righty. Well, thanks, everybody, for staying with us today. We've enjoyed sharing this information with you. For those of you who had questions that we were unable to address, uh, we'll follow up with you directly. If you'd like more information on what we did with Bosch, we have a case study on our website, or you can reach us at info at Thanks very much. Bye-bye.